your shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes, big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners, the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from 6 to half past 9 on GB News. I'm Dan Wilson. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wilson tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Good evening, I'm Olivia Guthrie in the GB newsroom. Top Ukrainian military officials have reportedly been forced to flee into a bomb shelter after coming under a shelling attack. Kiev has accused Russia of repeatedly violating a ceasefire. New, a new video released by the Ukrainian armed forces and border guards shows an attack at a checkpoint near the eastern town of Luhansk. The country also reported the death of a soldier, saying he was killed in shelling by pro-Russian separatists. The West says the attacks are part of a pretext to invade the country. <laughs> Meanwhile, the Kremlin has confirmed it successfully launched hypersonic and cruise missiles at sea and land-based targets as part of nuclear drills. The military exercise was overseen by President Vladimir Putin and the leader of Belarus, Alexander Lukashenko. The Ukraine crisis is dominating the agenda at the Munich Security Conference. Prime Minister Boris Johnson has warned the world can't underestimate what's at stake if Russia invades Ukraine. He told the conference it's vital that any violent act of aggression by President Putin fails. If Ukraine is over overrun by brute force, I fail to see how a country encompassing nearly a quarter of a million square miles, the biggest nation in Europe, apart from Russia itself, could then be held down and subjugated forever. After a generation of freedom, we're now staring at a generation of bloodshed and misery. I believe that Russia would have absolutely nothing to gain from this catastrophic venture and everything to lose. Prime Minister later spoke to Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky, reiterating the UK's unequivocal support for the country's sovereignty and territorial integrity. Boris Johnson also agreed with the US assessment that Russia's president has made up his mind about attacking the capital, Kiev. I think that uh, certainly things are in motion, but the question is whether uh, it can all be uh, pulled back and whether the uh, president of Russia is still uh, able uh, to, to call this operation off. I think uh, that possibility must logically still exist. Uh, and therefore, I, I think it's absolutely vital that uh, we have a, a path of, of dialogue. Mr Zelensky told the conference Ukraine will defend itself with or without the support of its partners, while the US Vice President Kamala Harris said Russia will suffer unprecedented financial costs if it invades its neighbour. And we will target those who are complicit and those who aid and abet this unprovoked invasion. Make no mistake, the imposition of these sweeping and coordinated measures 
will inflict great damage on those who must be held accountable. In other news, more bad weather is set to hit the UK, with forecasters warning winds of up to 70 miles per hour are expected over the next couple of days. Thousands of homes are still without power after Storm Eunice swept across the country yesterday, with insurers saying the clean-up bill could exceed £300 million. Record-breaking winds killed at least four people, damaged buildings and brought down trees, blocking routes across the rail network. Rescuers in Greece are searching for 12 people who are still missing after a ferry fire. The vessel was sailing to Italy when the blaze started in the early hours of this morning. Firefighters have been battling for a second day to control and extinguish the flames. 280 passengers and staff were rescued and taken to the nearby island of Corfu. The NHS is to stop taking cash from the gambling industry for the treatment of people suffering addiction. NHS England says the decision had been heavily influenced by patients who were uncomfortable about using services paid for by the industry, a view that's been echoed by medics. And Team GB has finally won a medal at the Winter Olympics with the men's curling team taking silver. They lost to Sweden 5-4 in a nail-biting final in Beijing. The women's team is also in the final and will play Japan early tomorrow morning. The royal family tweeted their support, saying Great Britain's journey has been fantastic to watch. TV Online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. We'll have more at the top of the hour. Looking ahead to this evening's weather, and the UK is looking a little drier and calmer, but only for a short while. Let's take a look at the details. Cloud will already begin to increase across southwest England this evening, with outbreaks of rain developing, winds easing for a few hours. Mild this evening, with temperatures of 10 degrees Celsius. It will be drier this evening across the southeast and London, with the winds easing too, temperatures falling away over the coming hours. Over to Wales, and after a quiet few hours, cloud and rain will begin to move back in from the west. Winds will also increase. Turning chilly for a time this evening across the Midlands with clear skies over Birmingham. Winds will fall light ahead of more unsettled weather moving in tonight. Temperatures hovering around 4 degrees Celsius. Any lingering rain, sleet and snow will soon clear away from northern England to leave a dry evening. Temperatures tumbling with some patchy frost and ice forming ahead of further rain tonight. Frost and ice also for a time across eastern Scotland, whilst in the west we could see cloud and rain beginning to move in from the Atlantic, winds also increasing along the coasts. Turning increasingly wet across Northern Ireland this evening, with Belfast holding on to the driest weather for longest, winds increasing from the west too, but staying on the mild side. Wet and windy weather with then sweep across the whole country as we go through tonight. Gales developing by morning and that is how the weather is shaping up overnight and into tomorrow morning. Thanks for joining us on the Saturday Selection here on GB News. I'm Esther McVeigh. And I'm Philip Davis. Coming up this hour, we'll look back at another torrid week for the royal family. And as inflation continues to drive prices up, what difference is it making to your family finances? But we start, as we always do, with a pick of the top stories from the last seven days. And to help us do that this week, we're joined by celebrity chef and top TV and award-winning presenter, Kevin <laughs> Woodford. Great for you to be with us today. It's so what's caught your eye? Do you know, it's been a week, hasn't it? Well, I mean, talk about a stormy week for news, you know, from everything from the royal family to, 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 to the storm yesterday. But uh, th there was one particular story that I felt very strongly about, and that was, that was to do with this 15-year-old girl, you know, this Camilla Valeria, who, who was destined for gold uh, at the Winter Olympics. Skating, I think, is probably one of the most difficult, difficult things in the world, right? And I'll tell you why I know that. Because for my sins, I spent three months on the very first series of Dancing at Night, 
on my backside most of the time, right? With, with, with Torval and Dean laughing at me. So I, I know just how difficult dancing on ice is. Right. I can let you into a little secret there. I was asked to do uh, dancing on ice, right. but it was as I was going to stand to be a politician and I thought to myself, we don't want those shots. No. We don't want that headline, <laughs> Esther dancing on thin ice. No, no, oh, we no. Did not want, so I didn't do it, but you were brave enough to go on there it's, and it's, do it. It's tough, right? No, it's tough. Were you on drugs when you did it? That's the question. Now, <laughs> <laughs> have I ever been off them is the other question. <laughs> no, only kidding, only kidding. But it is a, it's a tough gig, you know? Yes. It is a tough gig. I mean, you think of, you, you think of Strictly Come Dancing, where they're dancing, you know, on, on firm... Uh, terra firma, but you're on ice. This was a 15-year-old girl, OK? And for me, I think the key issue here is the fact that there is this whole fury about the drug situation. Now, now, now put that into context. What happened with this drug thing? This is a 15-year-old kid, right, that's under enough pressure to represent Russia in the Olympics, and, and the pressure would have been placed upon it. I'm pretty sure about that, because of the coaches there are really, really firm, really tough. So, so the story was that, that they tested her in December and, and she was tested positive for drugs. The drug that was found in her cyst, in her body, was frangina. And it's a drug called trimtazidine. And it's frangina. Now, what, what that drug does, allegedly, I'm not a doctor, but allegedly what the drug does is it increases the blood flow to the heart. Therefore, it, it, it gives the potential for, you know, greater athleticism. But... One of the side effects, allegedly, of the drug is dizziness and loss of balance, <laughs> right? <laughs> so how does that work? But the, the thing is... What, what Which you... she showed on yeah. her final uh, dancing. On didn't... more than yeah. one occasion, right? Yeah. But, but, but the thing here is, for me, is, is the fact that um, when, when there, were, there were three court judges that ruled that she could continue with the Olympics, mm. OK? And the story that was put to them was that the way this drug got into a system was that her grandfather was taking those drugs and that somehow, unknowingly, it, those drugs were in, injected into her system, you know. So, so there you've got this 15-year-old kid with all of the pressure that's placed upon it representing her country, on top of which the, me, the world's media investigating her with regards to drugs. No wonder the kid fell apart. But... The, the, the big, big sad thing here is the hammering she got mm. after mm. Her, her performance by the coach, which was, which was picked up by the media. Mm. Terrible. The, the, well, the IOC president criticised the Thomas coach. Thomas Back, exactly. For, for the way he treated her after, the, after she finished Absolutely. the Absolutely. And what, what's happening now with her? It's more than that. It wasn't just how, sort of, uh, the, I mean, the coach basically said, you can't give up fighting, That's you've right. got to keep fighting yeah, for yeah, it. So she, and by the way, she's got a reputation as being absolutely formidable. True and she's found other gold champions or, and what have you. But I think the bigger concern is, how was this 15-year-old taking uh, illegal substances? And she should be looked at for that as the coach. Not just how she spoke to her afterwards, it's what she was allowing well, the girl to take. That's what they're doing now. Yeah. OK, they've, they've actually started an investigation in, in, into, you know, you know, the coach, the doctor and other adults around this particular 15-year-old <laughs> kid. We'll see what happens. But I, I, think it's, I think it's so sad that, that a country will allow a 15-year-old kid to go through that whole, that whole horrible, horrible process. I really do. They should have pulled her at that point then. She should never have gone in, into, the, into the Olympics, in my view. Mm -hmm. What caught your eye this week? Uh, well, I'll tell you what caught my eye. It was Nick Clegg now mm -hmm. as master of the metaverse. And uh, I love this story because I think this is a chap who's made his career out of saying sorry. You'll remember all those uh, <laughs> online yeah. memes of him saying sorry. And I think he'll continue to do that at Facebook. Not allowed to say Facebook anymore, meta, because they've gone through scandal after scandal, whether it was whistleblowers talking about the mental health of young children, whether it was the boycott, stop hate for profit, which he kept saying, well, we need to improve, we'll double our efforts, we'll do more. Uh, and then the the other thing that people have pointed out, when, obviously, he was a politician, he said that uh, they were blatantly on the wrong side, the social media and Facebook. He also said the wages of uh, bankers were gratuitously offensive. He's now in that wage bracket. So I'm thinking, has this man 
got a cunning plan. Is he going into getting into the inside of Facebook to make it crumble from the inside because he had all these fears about it in the first place? Very much like what he did to the Lib Dem party. He got in, he became the leader in two years, and he crumbled it from the inside. It went from 28% and 67 seats down to just 8% and only uh, 8% and just 12 seats. So I think he's got a secret plan there. Clegg is going to crumble Facebook, sorry, Meta, from the inside. But conversely, the difference being, Esther and Phil, <laughs> is that there's a fiscal element to the role he has at the moment, mm -hmm. which perhaps he didn't have previously in his oh, political... Oh, and absolutely, and he's changed his views because of mm -hmm. that. It's no longer grossly offensive. No, no. It's, it's a, it's a There's nothing wrong with it now, it's great. But it's good that you would see politicians, you see, there is an afterlife. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you lose your seat, it doesn't matter if Why you, you destroy your party. <laughs> we think there it's, is it's, a life but I think it, it, For Philip, it's strictly uh, come dancing yeah, next. Yeah, and in the papers today, it was revealed George mm. Osborne was going to have that job first. Mm. Well, talking about very highly paid people, the thing that caught my eye this week <laughs> uh, was a lady called Lorraine Martins, who is Network Rail's Director of Diversity and Inclusion. Excellent. Who is earning over £160,000 a year, uh, the same as the Prime Minister is getting. <laughs> and her job, apparently, it says, is to ensure the railways are more open diverse and inclusive. Well, she certainly failed yesterday. They weren't very open. Uh, <laughs> they weren't very open yesterday. But what I want to know is, and, and I don't know, Kevin, if you might be able to help me with this, is what on earth is the Director of Diversity and Inclusion doing at Network Rail? I mean, we're trying to get the tracks open for the trains to run on and all the rest of it. What, I have no idea what the job entails. I mean, if, if Lorraine's watching, please get in touch. <laughs> GB New, views at gbnews.uk. We'd love to hear what you actually do. Um, but why, why does she have to be paid over £160,000 a year? But, you know, diversity we thought, we and thought, inclusion. We the... thought yesterday they needed a couple of more, as you say, engineers clearing up the a track as we couldn't get from one side of the country well, Lorraine, to another. She could have been out clearing up a few branches off the track. Exactly. That certainly would have been more useful yesterday, I think, <laughs> than whatever she does as the Director of Diversity and Inclusion. It's the way we're going in the world. Really, we'll have them everywhere, thankfully. Isn't that great? They're going, to, they're going to save us. They really are going to save us. They are the great. But, I mean, with on, on that particular note, I mean, you know, you're sort of edging on the woke thing. There, there was a great story um, uh, for, in, in connection with a school in Lancashire. Uh, and this is a head teacher that's decided that um, she wants to save the world and she wants, to, she wants to lead climate change. And what she's doing is she's insisted, over a year ago, that uh, the school meals now, uh, children don't have meat. It, it's vegetarian only, right? She, she failed to actually inform the parents that's what she was doing. She, she has dropped them a note now. Um, <laughs> but possibly because she, in that note, she wanted to let them know that, please, when you're doing the packed lunches for your children, don't put meat in, you know, just vegetarian. I, ha I have a problem with that. I, I'm all for... I mean, I spent a lot of time in education. That's what, that's, you know, my, my background was education before I, I started other stuff. Uh, and I was the head of a, of, of a large department in, 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 a, in a college. So I'm, I have a passion for education. And I believe that education is, 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 is the way forward for everybody. But you shouldn't impose one particular view on anybody in life, not at all. But you should educate and you should... Every, every child should have a rounded education. They should understand that there is such a thing as vegetarianism, vegan, and, 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 and the effects of that upon the world, but also upon you as an individual and the pressures that might place upon you. And I think you're... A, are you a vegetarian? No, I'm, I'm a flexitarian. <laughs> so oh, I okay. have everything. <laughs> I well, have a mixture of... But, but, you know, I'll do a day of fish. Cheese anything. Yeah, exactly. Oh, OK, yeah. A yeah. day of I'd fish. I've forgotten. A day of meat. <laughs> yeah. I do... I, I also do vegan because I don't do dairy, so I do okay. vegan rather than vegetarian. OK. That's Kevin Wood for there. One of the biggest stories of the week was the news that the Joint Committee on Vaccines and Immunisations finally approved the use of the COVID vaccine on healthy primary school children aged between 5 and 11. But with the health benefits to younger children still being hotly debated, would you be happy to give your kids the jab? Let's speak to Molly Kingsley from the Child Welfare Group, Us For Them. Molly, what did you make of this week's announcement? Um, perplexing, I think is the word I'd use. So look, my kids are 5 and 8, so I'm directly impacted by this. Um, they've had all their other you know, childhood vaccinations. I've, I've never had to think about this before. And 
Um, I think it, there are a number of very troubling aspects of this decision. So my kids won't be getting the vaccine. They've both had COVID. And, you know, having poured through the um, the letter of the JC and I, uh, JCBI advice, I just I can't, can see no benefit here for children. And, and actually, if you look at the figures and how they break down by the JCVI's own admission on the basis of the figures in, in the published doc document, you would need to vaccinate 2 million health children to prevent one ICU admission and, and that to me just seems absolutely bonkers it seems particularly bonkers given that we know that you know as with all medical interventions the vaccine carries a small but significant risk of harm and in some cases that harm is serious and I think some estimates put the risk of in particular myocarditis, which is the harm that you know people are most focused on it's not the only serious harm actually but it is the one that has received most most attention Attention and you know the risk of myocarditis, according to conservative MHRA data, is 28 times higher than the number of ICU admiss admissions saved. So, just where is the benefit for children here? Why are we doing this? So, Molly, do you disagree with the JCVI's advice that it's safe for children, or or do you just think that it's it it, it may not be particularly unsafe? I, I know you've just made the point about some of the potential harms from a, a vaccine. Uh, but do you just think it's unnecessary? Yeah, exactly. I mean, look, I, I'm not a doctor. I am not qualified to say whether this is safe or not. I am obviously someone who has been very intimately involved in, in watching this roll out. And, and I would be lying if I said I wasn't concerned at this point and I know I know both of you actually have been involved in various letters haven't you to JCVI and various other people I'm sure at this point you know questioning why are we doing this and in particular why are we doing it in light of a variant which thankfully is a lot milder you know why why are we playing ahead with this and like you I just I don't see the benefit and and for me actually the you know I think the biggest point here actually just as a parent is we don't have long-term safety data. And personally, for me, that alone would rule out me giving this to my children absent a really clear benefit. And actually, remember, this is under emergency use authorization. So I think, you know, I can perceive you might have a situation in a genuine emergency for children where it did make sense to roll out this vaccine. We are not in that situation. And we're not even in this situation for adults. So it is, it's absolutely baffling and I think one of the things that really really troubles me about this is it really undermines trust in JCVI and the public health system and I don't say that lightly because you know it's not it's not a comfortable realization to get to but I think it does because you read this decision and like you know it won't just be me it clearly wasn't just me looking at the reaction to this and parents are just you know that there's no benefit it doesn't make sense why are we being asked to do this Molly, I, I can see that you, the argument that it's, this is a solution that's looking for a, a problem, I, I understand that point, but some parents might say, well, look, I, I want my children to be vaccinated and, and nobody's been forced to have a, the vaccination. So is it, not, is it not fine that parents are able to exercise that choice on behalf of their, their children? You can choose not to give it to your children, but other parents can choose to do so if they, if they want to. Yeah, I mean, look, Philip, you know, I think in a normal world, I would 100% agree with that. I think we are in a very murky world here. We're in a world where it is fair to say that the harms of the vaccine, I think, may have been understated. They may have been kept to a degree out of mainstream media. So I think the first point I would say to that is do parents, if we are honest about this, have the full suite of information they would need to make? that decision for their child, and I would question that. I think the other thing I would say, two other points, is if we could guarantee that this was an offer to which there won't be a scintilla of pressure applied, I think many of us would feel more comfortable. Sadly, that's not what we've seen with the adult vaccination programme, and it's not what we've seen with the older age groups where, you Molly know, whether Kingsley. it's from bribing kids or, or actually, you know, pressurising because, oh, look, you're not going to be able to go on your ski trip if you're not vaccinated. Like, this is not Molly. a voluntary consent. And I think just the third point, and sorry. Molly, yeah. we're going to have to bring uh, this to an end now. But what I do <laughs> sure. want to say is thank you very much indeed for joining us today. And we also want to hear our uh, uh, 
viewers um, email, we want to hear from you, and you send that to gbviews at gbnews.uk. So, Molly, thank you very much uh, indeed, and I'm sure we've got a lot of our viewers who have a similar point of view to you. But coming up, it's Prince Andrew's birthday, but there's not a great deal to celebrate. We're joined in the studio by royal biographer Angela Levin. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you ask, so why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes, big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. The Duke of York marks his 62nd birthday today, but celebrations are likely to be low-key as councils in York take steps to remove the Duke's freedom of the city. It's already been another traumatic week for the royal family following the out-of-court settlement in a civil case against Prince Andrew, making a return to royal duties almost impossible. We're joined in the studio by royal biographer and journalist Angela Levin, and we can also speak to Daryl Smalley, a Lib Dem councillor and executive member for Culture, Leisure and Communities on York City Council. Daryl, how would you like to change the Duke of York's association with the city? Good morning. I think we'd like to remove it entirely, at least with the current Duke of York, Prince Andrew. I think it's been, as, as the case developed and as the allegations came out, it's been a constant, constant growing source of, um, well, I guess, shame for the city, really. Obviously, local government has no powers in, in these matters, so what we're, what we're planning on doing is submitting a motion to council uh, on the 24th of March to get council's consent to, to do even more lobbying, to remove his title Duke of York, but also then vote to remove that title of honorary freedom of the city, which he was given in 1987. Now, Darrell, obviously Prince Andrew hasn't admitted any guilt. He's not been found guilty of any particular crime is, is is it really appropriate to do that for somebody who, ha who hasn't actually been found guilty of anything i take that point and i think previously when people said should we wait for him to have his day in court i did have a lot of sympathy with that view however we'll never have that day now because it's been settled out of court and similar to what we've seen with those military patronages you know, the royal household recognized that it was that it was bringing serious reputational damage to those institutions he was linked to and i think we're just saying in york that it's a city of two hundred thousand people and it's bringing reputational damage to us as well in a similar way. And so we really need um, the Royal Household and, and the Parliament to act together to remove this title. I think many people, when we woke up to the news that all he'd been stripped of all his titles, many residents assumed he'd also lost the Duke of York title. And it seems um, absurd, really, that he retains that title, yet loses all the others. 
Is this something that's really uh, important to people in, in York, or is this just uh, a, the view of politicians and the, the local MP? Do, how do we know that the public back you on this? That's a good question. So a local paper, York Press, did run a poll of, of residents, and 88% of people supported removing the title Duke of York from Prince Andrew. Obviously, that's a, a straw poll, if you like. And you only have to look at my inbox to see many, many residents getting in touch and saying they support the call. No way am I saying that this is the most important thing uh, residents are discussing in York, from the cost of living crisis to energy bills going up um, to, obviously, the concerning reports over in Eastern Europe. I think there's many other things that people are waking up on their Saturday morning chatting with neighbours about. However, it's right that as, as local councillors and, and our own peers acted, it's right that we do make the point uh, across and, and lobby like we are doing today to make sure that we remove the title Duke of York from Prince Andrew. We are proud of our connections with the monarchy in York and I think it's something that goes back to hundreds of years and we're very proud to have had uh, and have the Duke of York title and that dukedom. But institutions right across the city are really reflecting now on what that means. So York Racecourse, is renaming the Duke of York Stakes to the 1885 Duke of York Stakes to reflect that actually that race was named after Prince George whilst he was Duke of York. So I think we're all doing a bit of digging. It's not just the council uh, okay. lobbying. Councillor Davos Smalley, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Now, thank Angela, you. it seems to get worse and worse. This is the Queen's big year. She's got this hanging over, and whilst York's calling him to lose the sort of Duke of York and also the uh, freedom of the city, there are calls now as well for him to have the removal of the Councillor of State so he couldn't even stand in for the Queen at all. No royal duties uh, whatsoever. So how is the Queen coping? There's other things going on as well, but how is she coping with this Andrew saga? Well, poor woman. I mean, she's lost a husband of 70 years. And if you look at her closely, you can see that she's aged enormously in this short time. Um, she's obviously heartbroken and her body has sort of shrunk. And I don't see that it's kind or it's winning a point to do something like this for a woman who's 95. I don't mean that um, uh, Prince Andrew shouldn't be um, dealt with properly. But I think when people start jumping on the bandwagon, oh, this is good, you know, let's cancel this thing, let's cancel that and take it away. It seems to be an increasing habit in the country. You want to close down a school, you want to close down the monarchy, you know, they want to make things all their own way. But the one thing I do agree with is that Prince Andrew shouldn't be a stand-in for the Queen. She has two extra people. One is Prince Andrew, one is Prince Harry. Um, there's others too, but those two um, would stand in for her at meetings and sign documents. I don't think either of them should be doing that. It seems that in comparison, losing being Duke of York is nothing. I don't think you can have people who've actually lost their title to stand in for the Queen or could be quite serious So that's documents. calling today for the removal of the Councillor of State. I think you that's right. You would agree with that. Totally. But, but do you agree with people now investigating where did that £12 million come from that he managed to pay off the court case and give a donation to charity? They're looking at the Queen's m money. You know, is any of this from the public? And they're investigating it more. And, and wouldn't any mum, if they had the resources, stand in and help the son that sort of putting more pressure on the Queen with that as well. Do you think that's fair? Well, he hasn't actually paid it yet. He's got 30 days to pay it, and if he doesn't pay it, there could be a court case again. So that's where we are at the moment. I, I think that the Queen is usually um, keen on her sense of being dutiful than she is being a mother, but occasionally it's the other way round. And this is an example of that, that she does love him. She might be absolutely appalled, I'm sure she is, appalled of what's happened. But nonetheless, it's very difficult for mothers. If you are a mother, you know that. You love them in spite of um, things that are, are happening in their lives. And, and I she's think got her other son as well, Charles now. This is yes. all coming to the front. And her grandson as well all of which is very painful and very hard. You could see she said to somebody who came in to uh, see her in Windsor, uh, a, a small job she had, and said that, um, you know, I can't move. So her body's actually 
freezing up, and I wonder whether that is because she's so tense and stressed about and how, it. How serious is this investigation into Charles's charity, do you think? Well, I think um, I'm very surprised by it. I've spent a year with Prince Charles following him around for his 70th birthday, and I've never seen a more generous, kind man. And he, I went up to Dumfries House, which is one of the problems of, the, of this money, that this uh, Saudi Arabian, um, Dr Mahouz, um, invested £1.5 million pounds to help him with Dumfries House. But what is created is loads of small huts, beautifully furnished out, with an A to Z opportunity of studying anything you want. Lots of these people have come off the street. It's not for his pocket. It's so that they can be apprentices... 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 What's it, word? Oh, lost my... Well, well, apprentices, well, think... apprentices. Oh, apprentices. Apprentices. Right. Well, I, I, I wasn't sure where you were going there, but <laughs> never mind. We got there in the end. Yeah. But, what, but the issue was that money wasn't donated for charitable purposes. People are now saying it was a sort of cash for a title, and that's what people are looking into. And his own son, Prince Harry, said when he was dealing with the same Saudi billionaire, oh, I'm moving away from him. It isn't right. It isn't, you know, I I'm not going to be entangled with this chap. And that's what his own son said, Prince Harry, yeah. in 2015. Frankly, I don't believe anything that Prince Harry is saying at the moment, frankly. This is not the Prince Harry before he left the royal family. This is a Prince Harry who's now totally against the monarchy, wants to destroy it all and will do anything he can to do so. So I think I put that one to one side for myself. But I think that um, what he did was create something that is marvellous for the country and for people who are suffering. And I think that if you award them something for that, there's no reason why not. Hundreds of years ago, kings gave people lots of land to build on. And I think that this is a similar, more modern version. Angela, why we love you is because you are so fair. You say it like it is. You know, Andrew shouldn't be able to stand in for the Queen. We should, like, adore the Queen because she's wonderful. And, you know, and people need to look at what Charles is doing. He's doing all the support for apprenticeships and he's doing lots of, of good charitable things. So hopefully we will speak to you again very soon indeed. Thank you for joining Thank us you. this morning. Now, did you take up cooking during lockdown? And do you plan to carry on improving your culinary skills, even though cafes and restaurants have fully reopened. Despite the temptation of takeaways, many of us took the opportunity to become better home cooks over the past couple of years. Some of us didn't. <laughs> Helped by people like our next guest, Sarah Bridge, co-owner of the Wilmslow Kitchen Cookery School. Sarah, thanks for joining us. Have you noticed an increase in the number of people who want to learn to cook? <laughs> Yes, we're really busy. Most of the classes are uh, full, but in lockdown, we did some free classes on, um, on Facebook. Um, so we posted the ingredients. People kept up with us as we were doing them. Um, so we kept in touch with our customers as while we were locked down, yeah. And is this, is it, do you welcome people of all abilities or do you have to yes. have a certain residual ability before, no, you, no. before you let them loose? <laughs> yeah, no, well, we we teach them the fundaments of cookery rather than just um, a, a recipe. So uh, recipes are different all over the world, but the fundaments of cookery remain the same. And when you understand the fundaments of cookery, it gives you control. So we teach that as well as a lesson. So when people go away, they've not just got that recipe, they've got control and a bit of understanding about other things that they cook. Yeah. Uh, no. Why do you think it's why do you think it's growing in popularity so much? Is it is it is it anything to do with lockdown? Is it because of the cost of living? What 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 do you think's behind it all? I mean, people really want to know what's in their food. They want to know. They don't want to be eating additives or too much sugar or too much oil, and they can control that themselves if they know how to do it. So it's a bit like they, they want to kind of learn how to make their favourite takeaway but in a really kind of healthy way where they can control the amount of calories that go in it. Oh, 
Sarah, I love the way you said, nobody is a lost cause. Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to throw, yeah. throw Philip in your direction and you might oh, change your mind. Along. <laughs> and you might change your mind on that. But what I want to know, obviously, I know you're busy tonight, you're busy all the time, non-stop. Uh, but I want to know, is there any funny tales there? Do you get competition and rivalry between all of the people who come and learn to cook with you? Yes, we, there's a little bit of that that goes on, especially when we get corporate events that we, you know, there's, you can see people trying to put a little bit of chilli in somebody else's, then getting <laughs> them to try it. Or we, 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 we often have about 12 people on classes and we, everybody gets a post-it note and a Sharpie marker to name everything because you don't want people getting their things mixed up. They get a bit cranky about other people's DNA in their food. So everything is labelled, labelled, labelled. And they look at me like I'm a bit mad, but at halfway through they're like, oh, I understand now. We don't want any swapping or <laughs> taking of somebody else. We've had, we've had an issue with the focaccia once, so <laughs> I've learned. Yep. And equally, you uh, trained under the Rue Brothers in a Michelin star restaurant. You are yourself a wonderful um, uh, chef. But you say you teach people the, the science of food, not just how to cook a rec yes. recipe as well. Yeah, so it's understanding. If you understand what's happening when you're cooking, you can control it. And if it goes wrong, so if you're reading from a recipe, that recipe is controlling what you're doing. You're like, what's next? What's next? If you know what's next and why it's doing what it's doing, you're in control. And it, it's a bit of freedom and it allows you to, you know, throw things in that you might think, oh, does that go? But you understand that it goes in because you've understood what's in food. So it, it, a, a little bit of, I mean, it's quite basic, the science, but if you fry an onion, and it starts to stick in the pan, people use that as a, as a trigger to go, oh, right, everything else needs to go in the pan. But that's a trigger that the sugars are going to burn and you need to lower it down and stop, take control. But people go, oh, it's burning, throw everything in. Do you understand why it's doing that? Yeah. Right, Sarah of the Wilmslow Cookery School. Philip will now be enrolled. Uh, you will have, yes. I don't know, a, a pupil. I don't know. Could be. I won't be putting my name on uh, my name on my sticker. To be honest, <laughs> I'll be trying to pretending it's somebody else's. <laughs> so if you can, if you can teach him, you can definitely teach anybody. Thank you so much for joining oh, us. Oh, thanks for having morning. me. <laughs> now, coming up, radio royalty. Paul Campagini will be telling us what he'd do if he ruled the world. Don't go anywhere. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. Basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News.
I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. As we do every week here on the Saturday Selection, we like to ask a celebrity guest what they'd do if they had the chance to rule the world. Yes, what law would you change if you were in charge for a day? This week, we're delighted to be joined by the author and radio and television presenter and a man who knows more about music than pretty much anybody on the planet. Paul Gambaccini, hello. Thank you for joining us. So our first question, if you rule the world, what law would you introduce? Well, Esther, first of all, I, I had to come onto the program because of If I Ruled the World being the title of the slot, because that's the only song recorded by both Harry Seacum and James Brown. <laughs> so you've got a real distinction. You've got a real distinction. <laughs> uh, I, I did fortunately uh, see a reform I wanted introduced by then Home Secretary Theresa May, which was reform of bail legislation. Now, the one that I want to see is anonymity before charge in cases of sexual accusation. Now, you may recall this is a cause that led Sir Cliff Richard and Lady Britton and I to make a submission to the House of Lords several years ago. And I can give you an exclusive right now and tell you that Cliff and I will be doing an encore at the House of Lords this summer. Uh, in case uh, any of the lords have missed the point. Uh, we really do believe that uh, in this era particularly, uh, if someone is simply accused and there is no evidence, there is no charge, they should not be publicized. And uh, that is a, a reform which has been taken up by an organization called FAIR, Falsely Accused Individuals for Reform. And uh, their eminences will also be going to the House of Lords, including Harvey Proctor MP, who was famously uh, traduced in Operation Midland. So that's what I would introduce. Now, I noticed this week, you may have noticed uh, the Supreme Court uh, supported a ruling against Bloomberg in a financial case. This was not a sexual accusation case. And they ruled that uh, it was correct uh, for a judge to rule against Bloomberg, who had revealed the name of an individual who was being investigated, uh, but not yet charged, of financial crime. The Financial Times editorialized yesterday against this decision, saying uh, that uh, in the case of uh, Cliff, the uh, High Court had uh, ruled for him against the BBC, and that uh, the media now accepted that in cases of sexual accusation, there should be anonymity before charge. But if it's good enough to be uh, unwritten law, it should be good enough to be written law. And that is what we are proposing. Paul, I think uh, lots of people will have sympathy with that. You, you know, your case certainly challenged the, the, the whole theory of people are innocent until proven guilty. It seemed in your case and in Cliff Richard's case that in many respects uh, you were treated as if it was the, the other way around. And I, I know you've written about this in your, your book, My Year Under the Yew Tree. I think you described it as being flypaper um, to encourage other people. Naming you was, was flypaper, I think you called it, to encourage other complaints to be made do you do you do you have any sympathy for the argument that the name should be out there uh, so that if other people to help other people who may have been a victim to come forward and have the courage to come forward two points there first of all uh, the case of Stuart Hall is often cited uh, by people who want to have people being named before charge. Uh, they say that people came forward after he had uh, been arrested, uh, but not yet charged. But in fact, Stuart Hall was arrested and charged on the same day. So he's not relevant to this conversation. Uh, the second thing is, as you say, there is the flypaper technique. Let's name someone and see if people call up. Uh, the Metropolitan Police uh, reduced 
themselves from being detectives to being stenographers. And they just sat by the phone waiting for people to call up. I was told uh, when I was cleared that when a certain other suspect was named, and this is someone who was convicted, the phone rang and rang. When I was named, the phone never rang. Well, that's no consolation to me because I was withdrawn from society for a year. Uh, if I had not been named, I would not have come off air for a year. Uh, Cliff would not have suffered his excruciating 22-month ordeal, and other people as well, uh, such as uh, Jimmy Tarbuck. I mean, I, I could tell you the accusations against all of us were so risible uh, that in... in uh, I'm a good dinner party guest now, actually. Because I <laughs> well, also, I also know the Supreme <laughs> Court judge, Adrian Hardman, said it was a radical undermining of the presumption of innocence what happened to you. But another question I'm going to ask you, you studied at Oxford University politics, philosophy and economics. Now, most people who do study that do end up ruling the world or at least <laughs> running the country. So I'm wondering, did you ever, you're doing this interview today, but did you ever fancy being a politician or a leader? I did not because I thought America would not be ready for a gay president. <laughs> and uh, Might be now. Until, unless with Pete Buttigieg a possibility, you never know. Uh, but uh, at the age of 72, I'm not about to give it a run. I'll, I'll leave it to the oldsters like Biden and Trump. <laughs> and the other thing which I thought was considerably rock and roll of you, you turned down, I think it was going to either Harvard or Yale to do law. Instead, you wanted to write for the Rolling Stone magazine and be the British correspondent. Well, uh, I was accepted at Harvard and Yale. Yale Law, but I wanted to get away from Richard Nixon, who was president. <laughs> uh, and uh, I was one of the people who uh, had my fate determined by lottery. You know, Nixon introduced a draft lottery to send people to Vietnam. Now, fortunately, I had a high number, but I, th I thought this is ridiculous. And I, I was against the Vietnam War. And I couldn't stand the lies that he and his vice president, Spiro Agnew, were telling. Now, of course, both of them eventually had to resign in disgrace. But by then I was over here attending Oxford University and, as you say, writing for Rolling Stone. Yeah, I'm writing lots of other, I think it's 20 plus books on everything from 80s music to the Eurovision Song Contest to Paul McCartney, Elton John. You've done it uh, all there, but they do call you the professor of pop. And I did want to talk about music control and what they did in New Zealand for the, uh, to sort of disperse the crowds that they didn't want protesting there. And they were using Barry Manilow <laughs> and maybe James <laughs> Blunt. So what, what would you have done and can you control people with music. This is a technique, believe it or not, that became famous under the uh, presidential administration of George Herbert Walker Bush, Daddy Bush, to uh, people who uh, can't distinguish the middle initials of the two Bush presidencies. And uh, the United States invaded Panama because uh, General Noriega had taken over and he was wanted for drug offenses. And so the American army actually stationed themselves outside the Vatican embassy to which Noriega had fled and played heavy metal at loud volume for three days. Uh, Guns N' Roses were a favorite, also rock groups such as U2, and I Fought the Law by The Clash was considered a humorous choice. <laughs> well, it turns out that the Vatican asked the United States Army to stop. But Noriega did come out. He was arrested. But th that got a lot of publicity, and it, it made some American uh, law enforcement agencies think, gee, what music can we get to just drive people nuts? Noriega had been an opera fan, so heavy metal was anathema to him. Now, recently, you may have noted that in some Black Lives Matter demonstrations, classical music was played to lower the crowd level of temper. And some uh, actual demonstrations were broken up because uh, these people couldn't stand nonstop classical music and it, it just drove them away. Now, in the New Zealand episode, they did hope that Barry Manilow would succeed in driving them away, <laughs> but it didn't. Uh, James Blunt offered himself, as you know, uh, as playable. 
Uh, and so what they did was they started playing Baby Shark, uh, which is th the most watched video in the history of YouTube, billions of views. Uh, but because it's so popular, the crowd just started singing Baby Shark. So I don't know if they're still there in New Zealand or not, but uh, this is a technique which is here to stay, and it just depends if you get the correct repertoire. Paul Gambaccini, you are absolutely the professor of pop, and I'm so pleased that you managed to come on the show today to not only talk about that, but also what you'd do if you rule the world. Thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. Earlier this week, the latest inflation figures were released, showing prices rose faster in the 12 months of January than at any point in the last 30 years. It was the 13th month in a row inflation has risen. But what does that mean for you and your family's finances? Join us in the studio is the business commentator and founder of Regionally, Justin Urquhart-Stewart. Justin, what's driving the current rise in prices? I haven't got over Barry Bandler, but <laughs> I think I'd surrender quite quickly if that started. Yeah, yeah really, heaven's sake. Uh, right, well, uh, the latest figures coming out really are extremely worrying because, and I know uh, you've mentioned this before, but th uh, this generation, generation four, haven't seen real inflation, double-digit inflation. Mm. Now, painful that can be. Go back to mid-70s, we did peak at a one point at 25%. So if you are on a fixed income, say a pensioner getting your uh, in pension insurance payment every month, and it didn't have any inflation proofing in it, which most of them didn't in those days, you were losing a quarter, a quarter and of, of the value, and you're not going to get that back. Um, so it really erodes wealth very quickly indeed. Now, the trouble is, some people quite like it. So, for instance, if you've got an awful lot of debt, it also erodes the debt. So governments quite like it too, on the basis you can sort of quietly get rid of your debt over time. But it is, it's, it is a very uh, dangerous item to have in the economy and very difficult to shake off because it's all very well. Oil prices going up once and 12 months later they haven't gone up again. So hopefully that drops out of the calculation. But if it starts getting into pay levels and things like that, and, uh, then you start embedding this. And we're seeing that happening now with all the price rises this week. We saw, uh, you know, whether it's uh, Kit Kats or uh, various other d domestic elements, uh, items going up significantly in price, everybody's going to be pumping their prices up now because they don't want to be alone. Yeah. So what's, what, what, should the, what should the Chancellor do about it? What, what can the Chancellor do well, about it? There's only a relatively limited amount to it. In the old days, you'd say, I'll put up interest rates. But, of course, the Bank of England is supposed to be sort of independent, not completely independent. Um, and uh, so you put up interest rates, and they've started to do that. But remember, our interest rates have been pretty close to zero ever since the banking crisis. We're at an emergency rate. It doesn't feel like an emergency rate, but that's it. So they've got to start raising those up, getting those up. And by doing so, hopefully then you can start suppressing. But you don't want to suppress an economy too much at the moment because you're recovering from a pandemic. So it's very difficult indeed. Some of this will wash through. So in a year's time, you'll find inflation will start flattening out a bit. Um, but the Bank of England hasn't been a very good leader on this. They've been rather sort of behind on it. So unfortunately for individuals, it's very difficult because you're going to find a cost of living going up. And of course, that inflation figure is a generic figure. Now, older people's inflation is generally higher, actually, because of all the sort of drugs and other medical items you've got to have. The younger you are, actually, your inflation is obviously reasonably cheap in comparison. So it, there's no one measure which is perfect for everybody. So what people have to start trying to do is trying to make sure that they build up assets over the longer term in things that give you a positive return despite inflation. And that probably means things like stocks and shares. Yeah, it's interesting you said there about the Bank of England, because we'll remember that front page, uh, the plank of England when he said nobody should have a pay rise. And then people are going to need a pay rise to be able to afford energy prices, food prices, everything else going up, mortgage rates going up as well. Yeah. So how is this going to unfold? How long is this going to take? I mean, what's any? But I know difficult to predict. But what would you say? Well, you're going to see this first year, this coming year. We called before, I think, a couple of weekends ago, the year of the squeeze. The consumer, we remember, which is the primary driver of the UK economy and the US economy, um, is going to feel really very tightened in their, in their purse strings because uh, we've got national insurance, we've got other tax rises coming through, basic commodity prices going up, and actually, it's often quite hidden. But some of the sort of low cost items of pasta and those sort of things going up a lot. So. Give it a year and it'll start getting a little bit better. But it's going to actually make sure though the interest rates go up too much, then you'll stop the economy. So it's a careful balancing act. But in a year's time, it should start to look a bit better. Year's time, start to look a little bit better. Justin Urquhart Stewart, thank you so much for coming in and seeing us. Thank you.
Looking ahead to this evening's weather, and the UK is looking a little drier and calmer, but only for a short while. Let's take a look at the details. Cloud will already begin to increase across southwest England this evening, with outbreaks of rain developing, winds easing for a few hours. Mild this evening with temperatures of 10 degrees Celsius. It will be drier this evening across the southeast and London with the winds easing too. Temperatures falling away over the coming hours. Over to Wales and after a quiet few hours, cloud and rain will begin to move back in from the west. Winds will also increase. Turning chilly for a time this evening across the Midlands with clear skies over Birmingham. Winds will fall light ahead of more unsettled weather moving in tonight. Temperatures hovering around 4 degrees Celsius. Any lingering rain, sleet and snow will soon clear away from northern England to leave a dry evening. Temperatures tumbling with some patchy frost and ice forming ahead of further rain tonight. Frost and ice also for a time across eastern Scotland, whilst in the west we could see cloud and rain beginning to move in from the Atlantic. Winds also increasing along the coasts. Turning increasingly wet across Northern Ireland this evening, with Belfast holding on to the driest weather for longest. Winds increasing from the west too, but staying on the mild side. Wet and windy weather with then sweep across the whole country as we go 